Who fears to speak of East or weak, that week of famed renown? When the boys in green they went out to fight the forces of the crown. With Mazars bold and hearts of gold, the red countess dressed in green. And high above the GPO, the rebel flag was seen. Then came ten thousand khaki coats, our rebel boys to kill. Before they reached O'Connell Street, of fight they got our fill. Ah, Liam, since the last time I talked to you, yeah. you were, we put you up on YouTube and mm. something like 1,500 to 1,600 people have watched your interview. That's a lot of people. <laughs> So I just want to ask you a few more questions, if it's okay. Yeah. Um, one of them was a, a blog called Come Here To Me put up a photograph of Liam Walsh and Liam Walsh's funeral, but the picture of Liam Walsh, he's yeah. in a uniform. That's could right. You, could you tell me about he that? Was, he, 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 uh, he, he was dead that time, actually. It's not Liam Walsh that's in the photograph. Yeah? That was taken after he had died. And uh, what we decided was uh, we'd have a photograph taken and uh, his face then transplants onto the photograph. So that's what happened, really. Uh, I was in uniform uh, in a uh, Condon's uh, uniform, as we call it, and... Uh, was Sam Brown? That's the one you're you're speaking about, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And uh, Cahill, uh what was his name? Holland. Cahill Holland yeah. was the photographer in Forty Four Parnell Square, and uh, I gave him the idea about uh, the photograph. He said, "Ah, oh, that's no problem." So it was he who uh, uh, took the my head off and put in Liam's and it turned out pretty good and uh, we distributed that amongst uh, members of Sarah Air at the time you know and to a lot of people in the north mm. and uh, but that was that was uh, a couple of weeks after he, he was buried that the photograph was taken okay. you, you would, could you tell me something about the funeral that day well the funeral it was the uh, he he uh, had blown himself up and he was in uh, Amien Street in the uh, what do you call that office down there in the in in the in the passport office in the morgue oh in the morgue sorry yeah. and uh, he, uh, <coughs> he was then. We then uh, went to 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 uh, Inchicore, St. Michael's in Inchicore, and uh, we we gave him a twenty four hour guard. You know, we we looked after him all. The, we we never left the coffin. We had reliefs, and we never left the coffin. And the next thing was uh, when I looked, well, I was in charge of the colour party that time, and I. Uh, saw the amount of people that attended the removal from the morgue to the to uh, St. Michael's and uh, it was absolutely unbelievable and eventually we got to Michael's we carried the coffin halfway up through Kilmaine and went into St. Michael's where we put a a, a guard of honour around it around the coffin and we never took it off <coughs> until we uh, brought him to uh, Mount Jerome. Was there an incident at, near the GPO or something? Oh uh, well we had a bit uh, we a journalist came to me in uh, just before we came to the GPO and uh, he informed me that not to fire any guns in Mount Jerome because he said I've just left there and he said they have an army of police up there and they're all armed. 
So he said, uh, definitely don't fire any shots up there. They wouldn't be worth it. So I said, oh, that's okay. We're not going to fire any shots. I didn't tell him that. That's what I said to him. We're not firing any shots. Until we got to the GPO. And then someone in the crowd lifted the, the guns and let off let off the guns there for the guns and uh, we went up then to uh, Parnell Square. But as the gun went off and the journalists had informed me that it, uh, it was uh, would be a battlefield up a manger on the uh, gun went off and there was a fella beside me, a guard beside me on a motorbike and he fell off the bike with a freight. <laughs> Because he was expecting it up at Mount Jerome, so he fell off the bike there. So eventually, anyway, we we arrived at uh, Parnell Square, and then uh, we said, "Well, now where do we go from here?" Because it was unplanned what we were going to do, how we were going to transport them. So I said, "Come there, the buses," and. Uh, we commandeered the buses, the guards agreed with it anyway because uh, they wanted us out of town and uh, all the bus drivers drove us up and drove us to Emmett Bridge there in Harlan's Cross and then we marched the rest of the way and boy it was some journey. It was a Jerry Lawless gave the oration wasn't it? That day I think was it? No I don't think so, I okay. think it was Jerry McCann. Okay. Was right. it? No, maybe. Right. I'm, I'm mixed up now. I, mm -hmm. I, it, it's, it was either uh, Jerry McCann or, or, uh, or Jerry Lawless. Right. Yeah. Well, what's his name? Not Jerry. Eamon. Eamon McCann, yeah. McCann, yeah. I'm not sure whether it was Eamon or not. God, I'd have to check that. Yeah. Eamon uh, didn't speak of Peter Graham's thing, did he speak of that as well? Oh, he did. He done, yeah. he done Peter Graham's. No, oh, did he do it? Mm. Peter Grimes. I thought, what's his name? Don oh, Peter Terry Graham. Galley. Terry Galley. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. Am I right? You're right on that, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So I, oh. I have a funny idea it was Eamon McCann. Mm. Maybe oh, wrong. Right. You'd have to check that. And uh, I'm not sure about that. Eh? But uh, everything went off well anyway. When we got in as far as Mount Jerome. The place was absolutely packed with people, and it, I don't know many guard that was there. The place was littered with guardy, but there was no trouble. I told I, I I I advised everybody that they were not to take on the guardy because I never believed in it anyway. They were, like they were there doing the job, whatever job you were sent to. Do. And that was to control, I suppose, uh, make sure we, we didn't fire any shots. But we had them already fired, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, I think it, it went back, the information went back up to Mount Jerome, you know. So they knew before we got there, the shots had gone, you know. Yeah. And then we, we went in and uh, we buried them there in, in, uh, in Mount Jerome. Uh, I don't know how many thousand people were at that funeral. Yeah, I think some recently just someone said there was 3,000 or more. Oh, that must yeah. be in Bower. Yeah. yeah, because, you see, what I done was, he had to be killed, I think, if I, if I remember rightly, I think it was on the Wednesday. So he should have been buried maybe on the Friday, you know, mm -hmm. that way. Mm -hmm. But he said, no, uh, let's bury him on Saturday. All right. Yeah. Because everybody be off then, you know. <laughs> and that's the reason why he's buried on Saturday. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, I know, you know, you wouldn't be putting uh, uh, people that would have walked or, yeah. you, know, you know, you wouldn't be inconvenienced and all that much. But it, it was the biggest and largest funeral I'd ever come across, yeah. And uh, around that time, actually, the funeral, yeah. the, or that period, the Sarah or uh, 
interviewed, I think, with ITV. It's a clip which is shown yes, a few times. Right, I yeah, think that, you that you that might be in the picture. On, yeah, that was yeah. later on. Was, uh, Would you I remember anything about that? It, I think it took place in Liam Walsh's home, his mother's home in, in Germany. And uh, because everybody was worried uh, about Sarah Erna because uh, at that time they they seemed that they were going to do the job and not the probies but uh, it was going on and uh, we interviewed I think it was an interview with the ITN was it? Yeah. Yeah, right, ITN yeah. I think interviewed and then we had uh, General uh, Tom Barry involved as well in so far as that we, we tried to get the three organisations, the officials, uh, the province and Sarah to join ranks and uh, finish it off and uh, when the thing was over, like, you know, to uh, sort out the political scenery then, you know, but uh, I brought Tom Barry with me up to uh, Parnell Square and the province uh, didn't turn up, you know. And uh, the officials turned up, but not the probies. Yeah. Right. yeah. Like Cathal Goon and people like that? Uh, Colin Goon, uh, uh, they, they turned up. Uh, yeah. The others didn't. Uh, yeah. Rory Abradi, well, he was, uh, I think, president of Sinn Fein at the time. And then you had. Uh, Then you had the RAD, they, the IRA, they didn't turn up. Yeah. Yeah, so. Tell me, yeah, when you mentioned Rory O'Brady, did, mm. did you meet him when you were very young? Do you remember well, Rory O'Brady? Yes, I do. I, I remember him well because I, I met him. The first time I met Rory was down on a campaign in Galway. And it was around the time of the, the sentence, the sentence of... Uh, yeah, what were they sentenced? Oh, they were sentenced. The Alma Raiders oh, were yeah, sentenced yeah. that time. And uh, I had books on uh, Clark, Philip Clark. And uh, I was raising money with selling them books and that. But that's the first time I was well, Rory was a student that time. Yeah. Uh, uh, he was at uh, attending college. And they were going to get a fella called Paddy Burke uh, elected to the doll, of course, on a, a, a abstentionist uh, as an an, an extremist, uh, yeah, abstentionist. And uh, I think that year we got four elected, four Sinn Féin yeah, right, yeah. were elected. Rory O'Brady was one of them, wasn't he? I think he yeah. was, and Tom Mitchell was another, maybe. Yeah. Mitchell was elected in the north, wasn't he? Oh, he Mitchell and Clark in the north. N uh, Mitchell, Tom Mitchell was elected yeah. MP. Yeah. And Philip Clark was That's elected right. MP yeah. for the Northern Northern. Yeah. Uh, and then four down south. And four in the south, yeah. which was pretty good for the forced out and you know yeah. and the people knew they were going to abstain but uh, I myself it was a waste of time Devalier actually invited them in like, you know to uh, take their seats uh -huh, did he? And, and, yeah. and fight their thing inside you know and he also got a great kick out of the fact when the, when the pillow was blown he, he, he was in touch with the government and Telling them what these should be in the headlines and all this sort of thing. This is a uh, devil era now we're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Oh, is that right? <laughs> he did, yeah. He, he, he was, uh, uh, oh, he was very happy that I went up, yeah. yeah. In, well, actually, when you're, when you're talking about the yeah. pillar, and I know you would know something about that. The which? About Nelson's pillar. Oh, yeah. And a concert. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you have any stories or memories of the pillar from when you were a child, even? Well, I went up on it as, as a child. I always remember going up on it. And uh, I went, I've gone up on it a couple of times, a few times I went up on it. But uh, the, the amazing thing about, about the whole effort is that uh, I, 
I was conceived in, uh, in early March of 1932. Uh, and it went up on March 66. <laughs> was it <there> some? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm sure my mother, uh, when she was pregnant with myself, must have walked past Pinard. Nan's supposed to know that that's the guy who's come. <laughs> Don't have to go at me. You know, but, but that's really what happened because I was born on the 2nd of December. <laughs> so I reckon I was, I was conceived in, the, in March, early March, which was around the 8th. Did your mother, have, you had did your mother have some story about Nelson or something? No. Uh, no, she had. There was always stories going about her, but uh, that was the story she used to say yeah. to me. Like you know, <laughs> if she got into bad form at all, I always remember that uh, if someone was contradicting, you say, "Oh yeah, that'll happen when we get home, Lil." You know, you know. So and this was in the in the forties. You know, just when you go back even years yeah. ago, could you have any other memories of the nineteen fifties or? people you would have met at that time, you know, people that, well, uh, like in the 50s, there must have been people that have been around in the 20s, like you well, said about Tom people, Barry or that. Oh, yeah, I met in 16, mate, from yeah. 16, because yeah. I met Elizabeth Farrell, oh, right, yeah. uh, Kathleen Lynn, right. and uh, Grace Gifford, and how I came along to meet them was, uh, I was, they never changed their mind. Yeah. They stayed Republicans until they died. And uh, there's a big, uh, there's a grave up in uh, the Republican Plot and Glass, and we're Elizabeth Farron there now. I don't know where Grace Gifford, she died around, uh, I think it was 59 or something. Farrell died in 57, I think, did she? She died in 57, was it? Because yeah. I know she was speaking at rallies in the 50s for the Republicans. Oh, she was, yeah, yeah. and she was a lovely woman. Yeah. Because she was, when I, when I seen her for the first time, I was only... What, how old was I? 21, I think, a little over 21, I think. And, uh, was I, I'm going to be 22. 21 or 22. But uh, when, I, when I met her, I collected her to bring her to uh, some function uh, to raise funds for the prisoners. And uh, I collected three of them, Dr. Kathleen Lane, uh, Elizabeth Farron, and Grace Gifford to three of them. And when she got into the car, I could not believe it because she was dressed in a sort of greeny tweed with, with, a, with a hat, you know, that uh, you'd see in the films now. Like, you know, she, she was a powerful looking woman, yeah. you know. And... Uh, she, to me now they were three three ladies like you know they they were beautiful, but then I also met uh, the man who walked with James Connolly up to the GPO, a man called Frank Robbins, and I met him to the union. I've met a couple of people like that along the line, you know, and uh, it's like uh, what's his name now. Did you ever hear of a fella called Dan Keezy? Yeah, yeah, from Did County you? Kerry. From Killarney. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, I met Dan, right? He lived to be over 100. He died only... He died 105, I think. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the amazing thing about that, I was up in a point uh, in the Liberty Bell in Francis Street, and this man arrived at the bar with me and called a pint I think and I called a pint and for some reason or other he started chat and he, uh, when he started chatting he, uh, I knew immediately he was uh, a Republican because of his, uh, his political sort of talk like you know he was on about 22 and 16 and uh, I said I, I was saying it's a long time ago and he was saying, oh, I was in 16. And I looked at him because Dan Keaton didn't look, to me, didn't look 70. So 
the next thing was uh, we had another point and uh, then he sort of knew then what side I was on to and he says, gee, he says, uh, you, know, you, you know your history. I said, I do, yeah. But I said, I'll tell you one thing. You weren't in 16, because he didn't update the, 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 the age, mm -hmm. like, you know. And he says to me, yes, I was. I say, your age. And he said to me, how old am I? Well, I said, I'd put you down early 70s. So he laughed and he said to me, I'm 95. God, he lived 10 more years. He did. <laughs> and he joined 10 years later. Yeah, yeah he was uh, 95. Either 95 or 97, he told me. One of, the, one of those ages. <laughs> I said, you couldn't be, he says, I am. And he was also, I think, Secretary General of the Fitness Association. Because he was a barman in that's Dublin right. all his life. That's right, he was a barman, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So he told me all this anyway, and uh, we had arranged to meet again on the, f the Wednesday, just on a Monday. It's on a Monday, and I said, I'll meet you here Wednesday. And I arrived in the Liberty Bell on Francis Street. And I met, I didn't meet, he never turned up. So I didn't know what happened, nothing happened. And the next thing, I I had forgotten all about Dan. But I was telling the story about Dan to loads of people. Yeah. And I was telling it in... Uh, in a bar in town called Grogan's. Oh yes, yeah. And I was talking to Tommy Smith there. And uh, he knew him, he knew him very well. But this old man is sitting down having a pint said, I, I know him, I knew him very well. He said, I worked for him. And uh, he told me, well, I said, I, I made the pint with me and we didn't turn up. He said, if he didn't turn up, there must be something wrong, you know. Because once he'd say, I'll turn up, he should have been there, you know. But anyway, I didn't meet him again. Until uh, the BBC was doing something on, on the pillar. And I was being interviewed with this journalist. And the journalist, anyway, was, he had done something and... The next thing was he rang me uh, one night, <coughs> late, and said, Liam, you won't believe this. He says, the wind that shakes the barley, the film, he says, the directors decided they'd send um, a limousine to Canary to collect this man. Ken Loach, the director. That's the director? Yeah, yeah. That made the film. Yeah. Directed that uh, this limo should go to Killarney and pick up a man there right. called Dan Keezy. Right. Yeah. See? Now it never hit me. This is, this is now seven or ten years later. Yeah. You know, uh, it could be 97, that would be mm. three, uh, yeah. four. I'd say about seven years, maybe six or seven years. Like, whenever they, they, they were shown it in Cork, the, the premiere was in Cork. So I said, oh, gee. And I say, how old is he? He says, he's 104. Yeah. Wouldn't that take the limo? Why wouldn't he take the limo? He says, no, 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 no. He told me he would get a bus to Tralee. <laughs> and there he says, he's 104. He'd get a bus to Tralee and he'd get the train from Tralee to Cork and they could pick him up in Cork. Now, I said, 104, you must be joking. 
Oh, he says. I remember reading in the paper, he said, I know he was walking to the cinema. I remember reading this thing. But right. He don't believe at his age. So yeah. the next thing was, uh, I put down the phone. And I was sitting there, I don't know, I, I probably sitting there watching television and uh, I said, Dan Keith, that rings a bell. And it was the man I met in the Liberty Bell. Mm. Seven, eight years previously. The man had never turned up and uh, he was from Killarney. <laughs> I only realised it when I sat down, you know. Actually, the, the farmhouse that they use in that film, where the rebels lived, Yeah. my father was born in that house. Oh, you're not yeah. serious. So, yeah. Well, I mean, that, that, that's, that's, uh, that's the one with Dan Keaton. Mm. And uh, I went down there uh, after, and uh, I'll go back again and... Uh, put a, a read on, you know, on the, on the grave. And he never changed his views, did he? Never. No. Wouldn't take... He got his pension, right? They offered him his pension and he wouldn't take it. And then, I think it would have been McAleese or Mary Robinson was the president, sent him a cheque. <laughs> for two and a half thousand mm -hmm. and he sent it back to her saying you're too friendly with the Queen of England. Mm. That's right, it must be Mary Robinson mm. because... Mm. Uh, I think wasn't Joe Clark, you would have known him. He was the same, he didn't, uh, wasn't it? No, He'd, yeah, he Joe. He didn't collect a pension, he said he was still on active service. Yeah, Joe, <laughs> I knew yeah. Joe, I uh, lived in the yeah. tenters there. Yeah. And, uh, he, he phoned the Rising, didn't he? Mount Street Bridge. He was at Mount Street yeah. under Captain Malone, yeah. 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 Uh, they used to they used to they put a nickname on him. Uh, the nickname was uh, Duck the Bullets. Cause they, they fired a few shots at him and he ducked mm. and he missed them. And uh, they decided then he wouldn't shoot him, you know. Because the 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 officer in charge uh, of the British, uh, as they came down Northampton Road, uh, it's Northampton, isn't it? Yeah, that's Northampton Road, I think. Yeah, the one that, if they had gone the other way, they, right. they, they, they'd have made it, but they didn't make it, they came down in. And uh, Joe was there in the school. That's right. And... Uh, was, there was only a handful. They were under the command of uh, De Valera. Oh, right, okay. Uh, because he, he was in charge of uh, that Boland's Mill. Boland's, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So that, and that was that, yeah. And you were talking there earlier, you met Tom Barry. What was he like? Did you? Uh, Tom, Tom Barry was a gentleman. Yeah. yeah. Tom was an absolute gentleman. Yeah. He didn't... Uh, Certain things he didn't believe in, but then I suppose years had taught him a lot more than it had taught me at the time, you know. Because he was great friends with Frank Ryan and that, wasn't he? Oh, yeah. yeah. But uh, I was at Frank Ryan's funeral in uh, White Fire Street White Church. White Street yeah. Church, and, yeah. and the reason uh, why he went there was the fact that an old Fenian who, who would come in in Parnell's time, at uh, that time there was a a, a, a hotel down at Western Row, and they brought the fee the, the whole of Western Row, Pier Street was packed with people waiting on this Fenian. And uh, he came in, and Parnell was there uh, and brought him all to the hotel for breakfast. And uh, he wasn't feeling too well, so he uh, and Parnell said to him, don't you go over and have a lie down on the couch. And uh, he went over and lay down on the couch and he died on the couch. And the Archbishop, uh, the Archbishop of Dublin refused uh, for him to be waked in the Catholic Church. I think it was Walsh, would that have been? Walsh, I think. 
uh, Archbishop Wilde's refused, so now maybe it was Wilde's or someone else, I don't know. It's so one of them uh, Archbishops, he was the Archbishop of Dublin anyway, a Catholic Archbishop. But there's one church who did receive him, and that was White Friars Street. And that's why Frank Ryan ended up in White Friars Street. Oh, right. Yeah. After being, uh, after he was uh, brought back from Germany at that mm -hmm. time, yeah. I attended that uh, removal. I was at that as well. Oh, yeah. yeah. And David Andrews was at it. That's right. He played a part in helping to bring him back. Wasn't that's he? right. He did indeed. With his sister. Irish, I think, or not. That's right. Yeah. 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 Because... Uh, I had a relation to a marriage that was killed in Madrid, like in the, oh, in the right. international, you know. What's his name? His name was Dinny Cody. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah. Dennis Cody, but they called him Dinny, you know. Yeah. And he was alongside uh, the, the uh, man that run the bookstore, uh, what's his name? Oh, Mick O'Reilly. Mick O'Reilly. Oh, yeah. right, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I worked with Mick later on in the years in the, in the buses, you know. All right. But uh, Mick was a lovely man, too. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I remember that very well, you know. Hmm. What do you think? I think it's fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Liam. Right. We'll come back to you again after this one has a, about 1,500 views. <laughs> <laughs>
She went in anyway. That time, of course, Dan used to wear the big cloaks and all this. Yeah. In he went with his junior anyway. He had the mail and he said to the baritone, you, you wouldn't have a deck of cards. He said, uh, before we go to bed, we're wondering, oh, see, I, I wouldn't loan cards to anybody now, he says. Why is that, he said. Oh, he says, two men came here, he says, a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, he says, and uh, I gave them the deck of cards, like, just like what you said. Uh, hand me down the cards, and he gave them the cards, he says. They start backing money, he says, and one fella lost, lost the kill, he says, and uh, fired and killed the, the other fella. See, they're, they're going to hang him, they'd be hanged in Cork, I, I say, in a couple of months, you know. Oh, yes, says Dan, I remember that case. Well, he won't hang. Well, your man says he will hang. Well, sure, there's no witnesses there. Oh, he says, I'm no witness. Hey, he says, yeah, he says, sure, I, I seen him shooting him. He says, he's definitely going to hang you. Oh, no, it's his oh, car. It was real off on money and he was pointing out different things to, uh, about the, the two men sitting down and this could happen and that could. He says, uh, he, he'd probably get a, a few years or something, maybe. No, says your man. Your man got very serious. He says, I'm telling you, he's got to hang for this. So O'Connor removed ten pound from a wallet and said to him, I bet you ten pound he doesn't hang. You're down. And your man put a tenner on top of it. The innkeeper. And of course the court case, it went the case went to court. And uh, your man has been prosecuted for the murder until Dan gets up. The cross examine and he says, uh, you, did you see this? Of course, your man didn't recognise it kind of this stage. He says, did you see this happen? Oh, I did, he says, yeah. And he said, uh, you seen him actually shoot him? Oh, I did, yeah. But is it not true, he says, that you're going around placing bets that he's going to hang? George had to throw out the case. But that, that was Dan O'Connor, you know, he, he got up to every trick. I say he was a good lawyer. What? A good it's lawyer. A lawyer. He was going up Lord Evans Street one day and there was a fella digging a hole, you know. And Dan is up for election. And this yeah, man says to him, hey, do you think he'll win the, 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 the election, Mr O'Connor? Well, he says, whether I do or not, you'll be still, still digging a fucking hole tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who fears to speak of Easter week, that week of famed renown? When the boys in green, they went out to fight the forces of the crown. With mothers bold and hearts of gold.